folks. Um, it's good to be in London, um, and also welcome everyone on the live stream. Um, me and my family last summer did the most British thing ever. Um, we went to the Lake District, and there we had our own little uh, leave or remain campaign. Um, that resulted in the Brexit, sorry for that. Um, so sadly, I'm not living in London anymore, uh, but we definitely had the greatest year here. So happy to be here. The committee asked me to talk a little bit about uh, having a career as a software engineer and sharing some um, lessons I've learned along the way with you. Um, I've worked for a couple of years at a startup called Mendix. Uh, I've been working for a couple of years now at Meta, uh, and I also had my consultancy business for a while. But most people will probably know me from all the open source business uh, happening, uh, like with Emer and Mobix, uh, and a bunch more. And so I will share some of the personal lessons about it. Um, so probably you don't need them, uh, but I needed them, um, so that's what I talk about. And when I think about software engineering careers, um, you can basically think in those three different directions. I wasn't really interested in the top one, so I won't be talking about that one. And since I think it's fairly awkward to talk a lot about myself anyway, I'm going to talk also about this guy. And I'm just wondering, we have a lot of British people in the room, so you ought to know who this is. Can I hear a shout? Yes, exactly. It's Eisenberg Kingdom Brunel. It's probably the most famous engineer ever. Um, at least he has the best name and the best outfit. Um, so we'll be talking about him a bit as well. And so the first big lesson I had to learn is that code will be imperfect. Fresh from university, I was always like, I'm going to build this perfect stack, use the best library uh, for UIs today, that is React. Um, I will use the perfect ESLint rules that mold my code in something that is very idiomatic. Um, sadly, after a while, you learn, in, learn that reality kicks in. There's always those annoying customers that ask for features that don't fit in your abstractions, uh, and things get ugly over time, or our people don't get exactly what you're doing. So the first big lesson, I think, to grow as an engineer is to learn that code will be imperfect. In fact, you could even say code is not just imperfect, it's just a byproduct of what you're trying to achieve. In short, code is perishable. <laughs> and Brunel is a great example of thinking about perishable concepts. For example, at some day he had this wonderful idea of like, why does a coach need a locomotive in front of it? What if he just put it on a um, pipe of air, uh, put some pressure on it, and move the wagons back and forth? So basically, he invented the Hyperloop. And that was like roughly 200 years ago. <laughs> and he built it, and it worked, uh, but it didn't work well enough. Um, so he was satisfied, and he, um, after half a year, they gave up on the ID, um, and they took the distance from it. And I think that's often an important lesson we have to learn as engineers, that we're not too attached to the things we build, how we implement it. Um, I've seen quite some conflicts over time where people were like too built in uh, to the way they solved the problem, and they were having all kinds of fights over basically nothing, um, like semicolons, semicolons or something. Um, so we have to be slightly detached from whatever we, we're building. And it has also upsides. A while ago, I was asked to look into this product that was built by a very different department. And they wanted to scale it up across the organization to multiple departments. And I looked at it, and it was pretty OK, but it wasn't entirely semantically correct. It could be faster. And so I went to the original team that was like already maintaining it for two years. Um, and I was very hesitant about it, because I wanted to basically propose to rewrite the core of the thing. Um, but I made my case. And actually, uh, to my positive surprise, they were really happy with it. And it resulted in a really good collaboration. But the only way that could have worked is because they didn't feel too attached to what they were building. And they were still having a clear sight on what they were trying to achieve rather than what they were writing. <laughs> 
Similarly, I also try to keep the fact that code is perishable in mind when I'm reviewing uh, PRs from other people. Um, and the reason for that is, basically, um, I want to make concessions on solutions rather than on relationships. Most codes live for maybe a couple of years. Um, relationships in business can last longer. So I want to make sure that like, whoever the person is I'm interacting with on the other side of PR, um, we do maintain our relationship. Sometimes people won't solve uh, problems exactly the way you would do, I would do. Um, everyone approaches things slightly different. And I think that's fine. And if there's too much risk, you can make a mental note of it. Um, but in general, I think we have to care about relationships around the code a lot. And I think that builds long-lasting uh, relationships. Or to slightly paraphrase someone more famous, laugh code a bit and others as yourself. That reference was too subtle. The other way to deal with imperfections um, is to think about uh, testing. The code will be imperfect, so we have to have a clear testing story. Sometimes I see, uh, especially in the Scrum world, that people bring up testing as a separate story. I don't think that works. That makes it the management problem, while it's basically an engineering problem. It's your judgment call to figure out whether you want to test something or not. Tests are always an estimation of what is the effort versus what is the risk being covered. And as your product lives longer and becomes more successful, the risk will automatically increase, which also will justify making more costs. But I see many cases where people don't go through the initial hurdle of setting up enough tests to make it cheap to add more. The first tests are really hard and expensive to write. The more you write them, the easier it becomes. You have more uh, test data, et cetera, et cetera. So just work on a culture where that's the default. But again, testing is also imperfect. So one thing um, you can really distinguish yourself as an engineer is becoming really good at debugging. And I think this is an often, often underestimated skill. So a few really practical tips around that. Um, one, if, one is a lot of people still use console.log as debugging. I don't think that's a very good approach. I don't have anything against console.logs. It's just you don't need them. The tooling nowadays can handle that for you. Um, take, for example, the Chrome developer tools. You can just, in your browser, go to a source file, uh, figure out the thing you want to inspect, and add a log point dynamically over there. It saves you the recompilation, the reloading step. It just adds a live console.log statement for your code without changing it. And it's much faster, and I'm always surprised how few people know about it. <laughs> Welcome. So yeah, this is not very career advice, but it's so practical. Um, your story benefits. Here's a more complicated scenario. Often we're trying to figure out how did you end up in the state. For example, why is the plugins in a state where I didn't expect it to be? One simple trick to find out where that thing is uh, being changed is simply wrapping a getter and setter around it. Put a debugger or a breakpoint in the setter, and you exactly know where a change is coming from. Very simple, very practical. Um, but the most important debugging tip I have for you is to uh, basically just let it go. What I do mean with that is that like, if I'm running for a couple of hours into a problem and I cannot put my finger on it where it goes wrong, I stop trying to solve the problem. And instead, I go to a different kind of mode where I s just start observing the system. I interact a bit with it, quite at random. I browse a bit through the source code. I go a bit through the logs. I don't really try to understand it. I just try to get information in my head. And then I let it go, go away, do something else, go home, uh, sleep well. And there's so often those moments where you wake up the next day or the moment you step out of the tube, and you're like, oh, of course, this system is probably sending messages over there, and it's going there, and then something very complicated. Um, but your subconsciousness is really smart, and there's tricks to learn to leverage it. So that's the first part, about learning to accept that code will be imperfect, and we better set ourselves up to deal with it. So 
I basically think when code is perfect, you probably have too much time on your hands. The only cases where I could get close to quite perfect code is when it was on open source projects. Because it was my time, I had to justify it to anyone, well, until I had a family. And then you can get to perfection, right? But there's no um, customers, at least not initially, you have to satisfy. So you can jack shave at your heart's content. But the second lesson I had to learn is that, like, not just my code will be imperfect, also, at some point, your knowledge will become incomplete. As a sen senior engineer, we can often have this domain where we very specialize it. We know specialize that. We know exactly what's going on. If someone comes with a request, we know where to go to fix it. But then, maybe we grow to something bigger. Let's take the Great Western Railway as an example. I think it still runs from uh, Paddington Station here to the west of the UK. But here's the interesting thing. The company was established in 1833, and our guy Brunel was involved in it as well as an engineer. And so this is one of the ads of the Great Western Railway. And I've seen some outrageous software ads, um, but this one is an interesting one as well. It talks about a train uh, from New York to London. Last time I checked, there's a small puddle in between. And here's another one. Uh, the Great Western Railway features a ship. That's strange, right? Um, but this was, the vi this was the vision the company had. The Western part was about the West of the UK. It was about going to the United States, to the Americas. And so they basically established a vision which has like many unknown parts in between. You don't have only have to figure out how to do the real life stuff, also how to do the shipbuilding stuff. And actually, Brunel know, knew about that as well. It's quite an amazing guy. Um, but I think that's an exception. Um, so often, when we try to set out a bigger vision, we're start to, starting to rely on other people filling in the gaps uh, where we don't know all the answers. And at first, when I started to uh, grow from senior engineer to a tech lead, and I did it at both companies, it felt very uncomfortable, because like, you don't know ab about the problem domain, and you have to rely on others. But then I discovered this interesting thing. It's also extremely satisfying that you don't know about something. Um, you set up a vague direction. You put out this idea. I think this server can to talk to this, that system over there. Not sure how, but it can achieve something. And then someone builds this, builds it. And that's even more satisfying than doing it on your own. It does change a few things, though. Um, so where your favorite tool as an engineer uh, could very well be VS Code, um, suddenly you start using other Microsoft products. Um, but that's the transition into tech leading. Another interesting lesson I had to learn here is that infrastructural projects, whenever you have a vision for a new project, that's always a catch-22 problem. And it often goes like this. Your, your customers are like, oh, I'm very excited about your project. Sounds really cool. However, if the technology was mature, I would be using it. And you're like, yeah, yeah. If you'd use it, it would be mature. I need customers to make this mature and have to, good test cases, etc. And so you have this catch-22 where you try to find adoption for something that still uh, is very imperfect. And the only way I found to deal with that is just taking all the ugly shortcuts you can find. It's not a satisfying answer, um, but if I have to build a new UI library and my first customer needs a checkbox and not a radio button, I give him a checkbox and not a radio button. That's just a shortcut I will take. And two years from now, someone will say, like, how can this be a, a, a serious UI library? Does it have a radio button? Uh, that's so stupid. But that's often because people miss the context that there was a time where the thing wasn't established yet. And they just take its existence for granted. And then you have different expectations. It's like when Paddington Station, right? That wasn't the first station to be built. It's a beautiful one. Um, but first, you have to prove the concept of a railway and station with something ugly in the neighborhood of Liverpool before you tear down half of the city of London. 
And so this is actually a, a real life case from uh, this. This was a slide I received last year. Um, and it talks about this project uh, we started in 2010, which was basically an enterprise service bus. I'm not sure why we didn't use something existing, uh, but we built it our own, uh, right? We wanted it to be perfect. And then four years later, the company grew so much that the scale became too large, and we were like, okay, this is risky. It's a single point of failure. We should get rid of it. And then I received this slide another seven years later, where they had finally migrated it out. And people, um, so I left the cat code base, like riddled with comments like, over here, in this and that case, this will eventually break down. And there were quite some of that. And it happened in quite a few cases where people started debugging a problem, ended up in a comment, and were like, oh, he knew about it already. Why didn't he fix it? Um, but that's the catch-22 problem. And so all those comments with temporary solutions, which are very permanent, will also be eventually consistently true. So it's a lot about the things you don't do, the problems you don't solve, um, solutions that you don't build yourself, even abstractions you don't build. So maybe at this point you're like, OK, this is a little bit of a sad story. Code will be imperfect. I have to accept that. My knowledge will be incomplete. I have to accept that. Um, it's no wonder our industry has such a bad rep. Like, look at those civil engineers. They design the Elizabeth line, uh, very complex, very big. And yes, they go over time, and they very much go over budget. But right, they don't think halfway through, oh, let's use this new framework and build a Hyperloop instead. Right? They have a plan, and they execute on it. Um, but to just uh, leave you assured, we will be OK. And I'm going to explain why with a last quote from Brunel. So remember, that guy was building bridges. And if he did it wrong, people would die. That's basically what happens if you're building bridges. And so he had this quote about bridge building. I am opposed to laying down of rules or conditions to be observed in the construction of bridges lest the progress of improvements tomorrow might be embarrassed or shackled by recordings or registering as law the prejudices of errors today. He was also quite elegant as well. Um, but he's basically saying, like, civil engineering was young at the time as well. They didn't have fi everything figured out, and so they didn't want to chain themselves up. Um, so please keep that in mind next time you add a new ESLint rule to your config. Thank you.